I just got back from the Winter Dune Imperium Invitational. This was a tournament where they brought in 36 of the best Dune players from across the world to compete for a prize pool put up by Mr. Beast himself. Now I should say 35 of the best Dune players in the world and me. They brought me in because I am a huge fan of Dune Imperium and I've talked about it a lot on this channel. Now while I was there, I got to spend five days playing Dune and learning from some of the greatest experts that were all on a very competitive level. They taught me some tips, some tricks, and some strategies that ultimately landed me in the top 16, which was a lot of fun. Now, I'm here today to share five of those tips, tricks, and strategies with you. These are five things that I learned from playing Dune with the experts. Now, this is going to focus mostly on Dune Imperium Uprising, the newest offering in the Dune Imperium series. This is the one that just came out that probably a lot of you are already playing or excited to play. So hopefully, this video will give you some guidance and allow you to become a better Dune player as well. So let's get started with number five. Now, there are a ton of different leaders in Dune, and you might be able to look at these leaders and justify that maybe some are better or some suit different play styles, and all of that is true. But did you know that the powers of these leaders actually vary based on where you're sitting at the table? For example, if you're going first on the first round, some of these leaders are way more powerful than others for you. For example, Muad'Dib, who is a character who wants to get worms on the battlefield, has to go through a complicated process. You have to go to some of the Fremen spots, you have to get influence, you have to come to the siege to gain the maker hooks that you can ultimately use to get worms. But if you're first on the first turn, that means you're going to be last every other turn after that. And so other players are going to block you and you will probably be the third or the last player to actually get their worms. Whereas if you're playing Muad'Dib in the second position and you're going second on round one, you're actually guaranteed to get your hooks first and be the first player to get worms on the board, which really leads into your power. In a similar vein, the character of Fade, who lets you retrieve spies from the board to add to your combat strength, actually benefits if you're going last often in the game because you get to see what every other player is doing before you reveal. You get to make the choice of whether to retrieve your spies and get that extra combat boost after everybody else has already done that. So evaluating the powers of these leaders and deciding which leader you're going to play based on when you're going to act is super important. Now, every table is going to have these leaders given out in a, in a very different way. Maybe they're going to let you pick your leader. Maybe they're going to give you two and you get to choose one, or maybe they're dealt out randomly. I actually don't recommend dealing them out randomly because you could get stuck in a position with a leader that is very weak in that particular seat. So giving you even two to choose from allows you to kind of control your fate a little bit better. This point is kind of related, but where you're sitting at the table, not necessarily the seat order, but the players to your right and to your left should dictate your strategy. Based on where the first player marker is at the start of the game, you know that the game is flowing clockwise. The player to your right will generally always act before you, and the player to your left will generally always act after you. If you see the strategy that the player on your right is doing, for example, if they're playing a strategy that is going up specific tracks or if they're trying to get spice or if they're trying to use certain spaces on the board that you want or that are important to your strategy, just know they are always going to have priority on those spots. This is something that's a little more nuanced and I don't always think about this when I'm sitting down at the table. I'm planning out my turns and I'm thinking, oh, I got blocked every single time. But if you're looking at who's next to you, you can almost anticipate where they're going to go. You know you're going to get blocked if you're trying to play the same strategy as them. Likewise, you can look at the player to your left and if you see them doing a specific strategy, you know that you can block them every time. Now there will be a couple rounds where your first player or their first player and that will change things up for priority for that particular round, but having priority access for one round does not change the fact that the player to your right is eight out of 10 times going to get to those spaces before you. So it's very important to kind of look at what they're doing, where they're going, and determine your play line in a way that they will not always block you. There are so many spaces you can go to 
on this board, but not all of these spaces are created equally. Again, some of these spaces are going to be better for different strategies, but some of these spaces are just always good spaces to hit no matter what you're playing. Spaces like Secrets, Frem Kit, and Highliner are going to be important for almost every strategy, but some spaces like Shipping and Sadukar are only really valuable to certain players. Being able to recognize what other players' strategies are, what their lines of play are, and what leaders they're playing are going to help you determine which spaces on the board they're going to go to. For example, heavy combat players like Muad'Dib and Gurney are going to be going to the Fremen spaces a lot in order to gain influence with those Fremen tracks and get their hooks like I talked about earlier. Being able to recognize that and block them could be a key important part of that strategy. Other spots like Deliver Supplies, which just gets you a water, might be undervalued with some players, but that water is incredibly valuable as is the movement on that spacing track because that's going to let you come over and do the shipping action, which is a hugely beneficial action. Now, being able to look at the leaders and the players at the table and recognize which of these spots is going to become hotly contested is a skill that you'll develop over time playing this game. But I can tell you from the get-go, Highliner is a spot that's going to win games. A lot of the last combats, which could give you a huge amount of points, especially if you have sandworms in the battle, a lot of those combats are decided by going to Highliner, dropping that five spice, and getting a ton of troops out. You can go there yourself and you can block players from taking the action by taking it, but other players might also block you. And they can block you from any key action in your strategy. That is where spies come in. That is a new thing in Uprising that is added in that gives you a little bit more access to some of these locations. Not every leader is going to use a lot of spies. Some leaders like Staban are gonna put a lot more spies out than others, but putting spies out in key moments at key locations to make sure that you have access to those locations later on is incredibly important. If you're in the early game and you're planning ahead and you know that you're going to want to hit Highliner on turn 7 or you know that you're going to want to do that shipping to get that last bump on a track, you better make sure that you have a spy in place there or find a way to put a spy like going to the espionage space on the board just to kind of set up for later. Even though these actions don't feel like they're giving you a lot at the time, you will be glad when they pay off later on because even if nobody blocks you, you can still use that spy to draw an extra card which might give you access to a different space you were wanting or draw into the persuasion you need to buy a spice must flow for a point or one of those really good cards that's out on the row. So planning ahead and putting out spies can be key to victory. Some leaders are going to put out a ton. You might only put out one, but that one can really matter if placed in the right spot. Sometimes you might see a card in the row that really works well for your strategy or a card that you really want. And this card might be expensive or not. It's just a card that you want to grab before anybody else grabs. You can kind of look around the player order and you can see when players might reveal. This is the turn in which they're going to spend their persuasion to buy cards. If a player has their swordsman, which gives them extra actions, or you know they have other ways to take actions in their hand, then you know that they might be revealing a little later. But based on where you are in position, you can see if other players are about to reveal, they might take the card that you want. Now, you might just ignore that and say, whatever, they got the card before me. I want to use all of my agents and I want to take all of my actions. But actually, revealing early, not taking your actions, can actually help you if you just spend all the persuasion in your hand to buy the card you really need for your strategy. Now, this is a little difficult. This isn't just a tip saying always reveal early. But in the tournament, we definitely saw players revealing early to get key cards. And I will talk about some of the cards that I think are worth revealing early for at the end of this video. But it's not always the best possible solution. You have to think about what you're giving other players, especially if you're going to reveal on your first turn, which we've seen done in the tournament. Players actually revealed without placing a single agent just to get a card that was very valuable for their strategy that went on to either help them win the game or come in second place. But you're not taking any actions that round, so you need to be able to value what would I possibly get from these two actions versus what utility will I get from this card. Obviously, earlier in the game, it's more worth it, your actions are less beneficial, and you're going to draw that card multiple times throughout the game. So if you can get a very strong card in the first round by revealing a little early, it's more worth it than doing so in round seven or eight when the game is about to end 
anyway. Of course, you still have to be cognizant of the blocking that has to happen in this game. You might be giving somebody access to a spot that you'd normally take if you're running a particular strategy or maybe you're about to hit a space that gives you a lot of spice. You're opening that up to another player to take that spot when you could have come in and blocked them. So there is still a lot to evaluate, but revealing early some people might say that that's always a bad thing. It is not always a bad thing. Don't be afraid to skip an action just to get a card that is perfect for your strategy. And here is the number one best tip that I can possibly give you when you're playing Dune Imperium Uprising, and that is always buy the Steersman card if you can. This is one of the most powerful cards in the game. Not only does it let you draw a card when you play it, it lets you return one of your agents to your hand. This can set up some turns that could possibly give you five actions in one round. It is very good. But beyond that, there are a lot of very good cards in this game. But these six cards, I think are the best six cards in the game. It doesn't matter who you're playing or what you're doing, these cards win games. We saw many games in the tournament determined by cards like Strike Fleet and Overthrow. These give you access to the guild row, they maybe give you huge benefits to combat, or give you bumps on the guild influence tracks, which is one of the most important and consistent ways that you can score points. While you can evaluate every card in the row based on what strategy you're doing, these six cards are almost always going to be cards that you should grab. That makes spaces like Research Station actually one of the most popular spaces on the board. If cards like these come up in the row, especially some of the more expensive ones, you can guarantee that players are going to go to Research Station. So take a look at the water that everyone has. Drawing two extra cards, especially if you could get rid of a card with low persuasion to draw two cards with high persuasion. If you've built your deck right, you can go to this spot a lot and always have access to these expensive cards. And even if these expensive cards are not on the row, you can always turn nine persuasion into the spice must flow which is going to give you an instant victory point now hopefully you learned a lot from this video and you're ready to go into your next dune imperium game with just a little bit more tips and tricks now i want to say a huge thank you to direwolf digital legendary entertainment mr beast and everybody that came out for this Dune Imperium tournament. It was a blast and I have to say a huge thank you to those who took some time to mentor me and to teach me. There were a ton of you out there, but there were guys like Lannister and Black Shadow and Badger who went on to win the tournament, Dinosaur. I just have to say a huge thank you to you guys for taking some time out of your day, out of your week to coach me. Uh, placing top 16 was such a great achievement and I would not have done it without all of your help. So thank you all for watching this video. Join us on Discord. I'll post the link down below to our TTS club. If you want to jump into some Dune games with us online, we'd love to have you. But until I see you again, make sure everyone keeps having fun on Arrakis.